Good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining class. Uh, can I ask Subhashish to lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Pastor. Heavenly loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together to know you, know your word better, Lord. I especially pray for Pastor, Lord, as uh, she is leading us, Lord. I pray and ask your Holy Spirit to take complete control. Let, Lord, you teach uh, through her and whatever the things, Lord, she is teaching, let uh, uh, will be prepared hard, Pastor. And I especially pray for all the uh, students. Uh, bless those who are not yet able to join. Bless them so that they will also join in time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. Uh, so last uh, class on last Friday, we looked at um, the doctrine of ch the church and we began with uh, uh, the definition of the church and we looked at uh, the Greek word for church, which is ecclesia. And we said that uh, church is, uh, you know, uh, refers to a gathering of those who have been called out for a definite Purpose. So ecclesia means uh, called out, uh, called out of. So we said that church is uh, a gathering uh, together of those who have been called out for a definite purpose. And we looked at each of these uh, words and terms, uh, you know, uh, who are called out, what are they called out, what is the definite purpose. And then we looked at uh, <clears throat> the important truths about the church uh, which is the body of Christ. And we also looked at the important truths concerning the local church, um, after which we looked at the mission of the local church, uh, which is categorized into five main areas. So we looked at the five main areas. And then we were looking at the local church as a body, a family, and an army. Okay, so we were basically uh, looking at how uh, the local church is a family, and uh, we said because the local church is a family, there are certain practices that uh, we should pursue. Uh, the first one we said is to walk in brotherly and sisterly love, uh, and we said to walk in brotherly and sisterly love, we need to be kind to each other. Uh, we need to give preferences to one another. Uh, we need to do good to those who are of the household of faith. Now, basically, when we talk about uh, a household, uh, you know, the church is referred to uh, in the scriptures as a household. So, you know, doing good to those uh, who are part of uh, the church, um, part of the believers, uh, one in faith in Christ Jesus. We also said we need to walk in brotherly and sisterly love. Uh, you know, we walk in brotherly and sisterly love and we support uh, uh, those who are weak and restore the fallen. Okay, so this is where we had stopped. Um, we'll continue from here. So how do we walk in brotherly and sisterly love as a church, as a body of, uh, of Christ, as a body of uh, believers? Is uh, we, you know, we need to support those who are weak and we need to restore those who are fallen. Okay, so all of us, uh, you know, fall at different uh, times in our life. We need support. We need encouragement. We need help. Uh, we need people to strengthen and uh, build us up. Uh, and so we need to, uh, you know, instead of um, uh, uh, instead of laughing at them, putting them down, criticizing them, condemning uh, people uh, who've gone astray, who've fallen into sin, you know, we need to gently, in love, um, restore them. Like it says in Scripture, uh, Romans chapter 15, verses uh, 1 and 2, uh, it says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the uh, uh, you know, scruples of the weak. We need to bear with those who are weak. Um, and, uh, you know, it says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification in verse 2 of Romans chapter 15. So we need to, uh, those of us who are strong, we need to bear with uh, uh, the frailties, the weaknesses of those who are weak. And we also need to, uh, you know, do good to please our neighbors so that we can edify them. We can build them up in the faith and in Christ Jesus. Uh, we can also look at um, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Can one of you please read that? 
where it talks about how we need to support the weak and restore those who are falling. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Anyone would like to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2? Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch over yourself, or you may also be tempted. Second, carry each other's burden, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of the Christ. Thank you. So here it says that uh, if anyone is caught in a sin, uh, you know, we who are spiritual or we who are mature, we need to restore uh, that person in a spirit of gentleness. Uh, you know, maybe the sin is uh, grievous, maybe the sin is really great, uh, you know, but uh, we need to be gentle with that person so that we do not lose that person totally uh, uh, to Satan, uh, to his, that he will be lost in his sin, but we need to uh, restore him uh, gently. Okay, so that is what we need to do as uh, believers, those who are a part of the family of the local church. So we walk in brotherly and sisterly love, uh, being kind to each other, giving preference to one another, doing good to those who are part of the church and supporting the weak and restoring the fallen. Uh, the second practice that we need to follow as a local church is to keep the unity and fellowship of the uh, spirit. Okay, so everything that we do at church, in the local church, we need to maintain unity. And this is what the Holy Spirit brings in us. Uh, we know that the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, they work in perfect unity and in oneness. And it's uh, their desire that uh, we, their uh, family, uh, you know, who are building uh, uh, their kingdom here on earth, who are representatives of God Most High, you know, we need to also maintain unity. And we know that this is, uh, we looked at it in, even in John chapter 17, uh, the high priestly prayer of uh, Jesus, where Jesus says, Father, let there be one as we are one. So it's God's desire that, you know, we do everything in unity. Um, and this is what the Holy Spirit brings uh, about. He brings about unity by strengthening our uh, ties okay so we are uh, to be people who do things that promote peace harmony uh, quietness and rest amongst us uh, if there is no unity in the church we will not be able to see the work of the holy spirit the manifest presence of the holy spirit in his full power will not be a uh, witness in our church uh, in our local church in our uh, gathering because uh, there is this unity, okay? So we need to uh, practice keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, we need to remove all things that bring about division and strife uh, because division uh, weakens us. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 25 says, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand, okay? So one of the uh, ways the enemy... Uh, tries to destroy a local church is just by bringing about disunity um, uh, and strife uh, and division. And we know that once he brings about disunity, there's division and that church cannot stand. It will be uh, divided. Okay. And we also, uh, to maintain unity, we need to cut out all gossip, uh, grumbling against each other, murmuring about one another. And that is what it says in James chapter 5, verse 9. It says, do not grumble against one another, brethren. That means brethren, it's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should not grumble against one another. Uh, you know, lest you be condemned, behold, the judge is standing at the door. And also to maintain a unity and to keep the unity of the spirit in uh, the local church, uh, we need to do... Um, you know, um, everything uh, uh, in oneness, in unity, and do nothing out of selfish ambition or self 
promotion. The moment there is uh, jealousy that creeps in, there is selfish ambition, self-promotion, uh, you know, then we can see uh, it's slowly, uh, you know, transferring into uh, be bringing about disunity and uh, strife. Okay, so sometimes, uh, you know, even we need to put down our egos. Sometimes we need to even give way, uh, give room to other people uh, to do things, to let them do their thoughts, their ideas, uh, uh, you know, what are their plans, uh, if God has revealed it to them. Uh, just work in perfect unity with the pastor who's leading uh, the church because he's hearing from God, he's um, uh, he's doing what God wants him to do, uh, you know, honor the leader, uh, just walk in step with what the leader is saying uh, so that, you know, uh, it'll it'll kind of be easier for the leader himself or herself to uh, lead the congregation. And also there will be unity and we can see the work of God just moving mightily in our uh, midst. So a church is not a place for us to bring about our own selfish ambitions, our plans, our agendas, uh, to do what we think is right uh, for our self-promotion, uh, but always do what God wants us to do in step with what the leader is telling us, uh, walking in step. Yes, of course, if the leader is going way away from, uh, you know, falling apart from God's will and God's plan and purpose, uh, we know that then there's no point in uh, gossiping about him. But, you know, as elders, we need to go and gently in love, like we uh, uh, which we just read, uh, you know, correct the leader uh, so that the church is not uh, divided, so that the church is not destroyed. Um, and uh, we need to take the necessary steps, but do that all in love, uh, speaking the truth in love, as it says in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 6, I think. And... Uh, you know, but don't put forth your own selfish ambitions and self-promotion because when our plans, our agendas, our ambitions are not fulfilled, uh, that's when we get very irritated, we get angry, we get upset, uh, you know, then we can start uh, murmuring, complaining, grumbling, uh, talking, uh, you know, behind people, gossiping, slander. Uh, which is also demonic uh, because it's not coming from God. It's all from the uh, it's all uh, the work of the evil spirit uh, in our lives. So we need to be careful that we root out every kind of selfish ambition and self promotion, like it says in Philippians uh, chapter two verse three. Can one of you please read uh, Philippians chapter two verse three, please? Do nothing out of selfish. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Subhashish. Sorry. Uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or when conceived, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Thank you. So it says, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility of mind or lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves, better than himself. Okay, so here it is, do nothing out of selfish ambition, uh, but do things out of humility, and out of humility, esteem others uh, better than uh, yourself. Okay, so that is what scripture says. And uh, this is something that we find very difficult in, uh, you know, whether it's in our families or whether uh, family set up uh, is in relationships, um, you know, even in the church, we find this very difficult. Uh, but we need to put uh, behind our selfish ambitions, our selfish uh, agend agendas and promotions. Uh, and we need to, uh, you know, come together in humility and esteem others better than ourselves. Okay, so when we come to church or whether we are in a family, you know, each one of us have our own opinions. Um, 
but uh, you know it's good to f put forth your suggestion and your opinion um, but when uh, you know people make the decision wh whose opinion or suggestion is the best you know it should not hurt our egos uh, we should not uh, feel uh, hurt or uh, you know think that uh, our plans our suggestions is not being taken uh, you know we need to go with the decision that is being made um, you know we have uh, uh, to flow with, together with uh, what, uh, you know, uh, like-minded people have decided. Um, and so that's what Philippians chapter 2 verse 2 says that, you know, we need to learn to flow together by becoming like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and uh, of one mind. Okay, so that's very important. And uh, I think, you know, whatever it is, we... Uh, we need to strive to bear, uh, to keep the unity of the spirit uh, uh, in the church. Yes, there will be many people, if you're a leader, you know, there'll be many people who will uh, talk bad about you, who will laugh behind your back, who will gossip behind your back, uh, you know, who will do things that uh, will kind of uh, hinder the, uh, the flow, the peace. But as a leader, if you are somebody who's striving for unity, uh, and not getting back at these people, uh, you know, uh, you know, don't waste your time. It's a waste of time uh, to fight back uh, with people. It's a waste of time to uh, to hear what they're saying. It's a waste of time to get back to, uh, you know, uh, to teach them a lesson, so to say, uh, because it drains you of all your energy, your time uh, that can be, uh, you know, uh, used or channelized in a meaningful way uh, to invest in the kingdom of God. And these are fights that are not worth fighting because uh, Paul says our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. So we need to know that it's the evil one that is working in and through. And of course, these people have given room uh, for that. So we really can't fight them because uh, fighting them is going to cause uh, division and strife. Uh, the best thing to do is just let it go uh, and submit it in the hands of God. And when you do that, you will be amazed to see how God beautifully will uh, orchestrate things for you, uh, will keep the church running, will keep the organization running, will keep uh, whatever uh, project you are involved in going forward and will remove the clutter, will remove the people who are kind of being a hindrance kind of being a disturbance uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, you are not just fighting a battle. It's God who's fighting the battle for you. And we know that, you know, when God fights the battle for you, there's always victory. Okay. So it's very important that uh, you, uh, you strive to keep the unity of the uh, unity uh, in the, in the group, in the uh, act, the church, uh, what uh, you're serving, whether you're part of the children's church or youth ministry, or you're part of a, uh, you know, um, a cell group or a life group at your home, a Bible study group, you know, you just do everything to love the people, uh, keep things going, just do what God has planned and will for you. Don't uh, look at all of the extra unnecessary things. Just continue running your race uh, and, you know, uh, the God, him, uh, God who is, uh, uh, who is the master of the church, who's the owner of the church, who's the head of the church. He knows. He sees. Uh, he will fight your battles. He will uh, remove things for you. And that is, I think, that is my. It's been my experience. Um, the last, uh, you know, twenty-one years being in being in ministry. Uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, handled, uh, led projects, initiated projects. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people who come, uh, who try to bring bring about uh, disturbance in the project, who try to uh, break the unity. Uh, there's gossiping, there's jealousy, there's hate. Uh, but I've never fought them because I've never had the time to uh, and never had the energy to. I just let it go in God's hand. And I've just seen God miraculously uh, work, but it's important that you are focused on what you are called to do. A calling is not to fight people. A calling is not to, um, you know, um, 
uh, put down people to see what they're saying and how we can prove ourselves right. We can never prove ourselves right uh, to people who are trying to prove us wrong. Uh, so it's a waste of time and energy and it's something that Satan will also, uh, you know, make a detour. Uh, so it's important for you to be focused on what God has called you. Uh, just keep things running. Uh, uh, you know, the back of your mind, what's happening, but let go. Uh, and you see how miraculously God fights your battle. Uh, and you know, the battle always belongs to the Lord. So that has been uh, my testimony. That has been what I have witnessed and I have seen. And I have just thanked God for, uh, you know, keeping the project, keeping the group uh, safe. There's no division. There's no confusion. Uh, but just rooming away people who are trying to bring about uh, uh, disturbance and uh, division uh, in the group. Okay, so I think we all need to learn that and God uh, will give us the strength and the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. The next thing that we need to do is, um, you know, um, uh, we uh, apart from just walking in brotherly and sisterly love and also keeping the uh, unity and fellowship of the Spirit, uh, you know, uh, in a family, uh, everyone works. Okay, in a family, uh, if you take a family unit, everyone is responsible at home uh, to do something for the running of the house other than little children. Okay, so similarly, in the house of God, all of us have a responsibility uh, that we need to do, that we need to uh, help in, that we need to pitch in. Uh, so we need to rise up and do our part for the functioning of the house of God. Um, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. So all of us, you know, don't go to church just for us to receive uh, uh, things from the word of God, uh, just to receive blessing, just to uh, experience the presence of God, the move of God, uh, the healing, deliverance of God. Uh, you know, that is part of, uh, you know, why the church meets, the word church fellowships. But, uh, you know, all of us also need to serve and not just sit back uh, to be uh, served. So when all of us pitch in, you know, it helps in the smooth functioning and the running of the uh, church. So there are some areas where um, uh, we are to help one another. Uh, and there are some areas that we need to carry uh, our own responsibility as individuals uh, in the church. So in the family, we know that, uh, you know, as family, as a unit, we see that each of us uh, uh, do our own responsibilities um, uh, so that there's a smooth functioning in the family. Uh, so we also at times help each other, pitch in for each other. Uh, but there are times, that, but most of the time we need to do our own responsibilities. We can't can't expect others in the family uh, to do our own work. There are some things that are our own responsibility. We need to uh, take care of that. So we need to help one another uh, in um, carrying each other's burden. So in a church, if there is people who are hurt, going through grief, going through loss, uh, loss of job, or uh, there's depression, there's sadness, um, there's um, there's separation or there's a breakdown in relationships, then we uh, we come alongside them, we help them, we support them. Uh, if there's sickness in the family, we just uh, are there for them to help and care for them. Uh, so they, this could be life challenges, uh, struggles, difficulties, uh, you know, anything that would they would people would face from time to time. And we need to be there to help each other. We need to be there to support each other. Like it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse uh, 2 uh, and verse 5, it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, uh, bear one another's burdens. Uh, that means bear one another's weight, their load. Uh, and when we do that, we fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, what is the law of Christ here? What is the law of Christ here? I it's think it is helping one another. Uh, sorry, it is... Helping one another in need. Helping one another in need. Okay, thank you, Lubega. What else is the law of Christ? It could also be, you know, loving our neighbor just as we love ourselves, right? 
uh, when we go through problems and difficulties, we need help, we need support, we need encouragement, we need people to come alongside us and help us the same way we need to love our neighbors just like we love ourselves. And verse 5 says, for each one will bear his own load. So there are two things here that we need to, we can see that we need to bear one another's burdens, uh, help each other. Uh, but in verse 5, it says, but each one shall also bear his own load. That means we need to do our own uh, tasks, our own responsibility. Um, you know, we need to work. We can't uh, depend on the church to feed us, uh, to help us, to pay our bills, to take care of our children, to take care of our families. Uh, you know, we need to... Uh, uh, take care of our own things, our own families, uh, uh, by working hard, by earning, uh, and uh, you know, not uh, uh, you know, living in un uh, unwanted excessive greed, uh, just you know, um, getting into debt, and uh, you know, when we're not able to pay the debt, you know, we want people at church to help us. We want uh, church members to help us. We want uh, the church to help us. And if they don't, we kind of think that, you know, there's no love in this church. There's no support. Um, well, the church is there to help and support, but those in times of need, like even if you look at um, uh, what Paul writes to Timothy, uh, when Timothy is um, overseeing the churches at Ephesus, uh, he says, you know, uh, the church should help uh, the widows, but if the widows have uh, children, grandchildren, uh, you know, a good family who can support them, who can take care of their needs, then the family, uh, you know, uh, should take on the responsibility and not leave the burden to the church. But yes, if a widow has uh, uh, no children uh, and, you know, she's been somebody who's been part of the church, she's uh, been very prayerful, she's been uh, spending her time in praying, then the church should take care of the uh, the needs of such a widow. So uh, Paul is writing to Timothy and he's saying, uh, you know, uh, you know, the church can take care of people in need, but it's important that people, that families take their own responsibility first, uh, fulfill their own responsibilities towards um, their family members by working hard by and not putting on the responsibility to the church. So each one of us must do our own work, discharge our own responsibilities. Uh, we are to bear our own lo load, that is, we need to fulfill our own duties. Okay, so this is... Um, just in brief about how um, uh, the local church is a family. We saw the local church as a body, body of Christ. Uh, uh, now we look at the local church as a family. Uh, we look at the local church uh, next as an army. Okay. If you notice that, uh, you know, uh, this, um, uh, the notes, what I've been uh, what have been what I have been saying so far is not there in your notes, uh, but I've taken it uh, from uh, Pastor's book, uh, uh, The House of God. So you know it's a good read. It's a good book to read. Um, so please take time to read that book. It will help you. Those of you who are pastors, uh, who are evangelists, who are part of uh, a church and building up a church, it's a good book to read. Okay, we look at uh, the church as an army. Uh, so even as, uh, you know, uh, these are like big chapters, I've kind of taken uh, a few uh, points here, which are important. So it's important that you can also make, uh, take notes for yourself, you can uh, take down notes that will help you. Okay, church is an army. Um, now, why is church referred to as an army? You know, we are called to be people of peace, not to be people of war. Uh, it's an army. That means we are preparing for battle. We are preparing to defend ourselves. Uh, why is the church called an army? Any thoughts? Yes, Lubega. First of all, we are. Uh, it's an army because each of us gets armories, as we see in Ephesians. Number two. It's an army because we do fight against the principalities of of uh, of the in the atmosphere, and we also keep fighting. We should keep guard because every day now and then we fight against the devil. We flee from the devil. Of course, when we flow, we are flowing, we are fleeing. It means 
we we are also soldiers in one way or the other. So those are some of the things that I can instantly mention. Thank you, Lubega. Yes, uh, thank you, Subhashish. We are in a spiritual warfare. Anything else? Do you think this concept came about only in the New Testament that the church is an army? When Paul writes in his various uh, epistles about, uh, you know, fighting, um, putting on our spiritual armor, fighting against that enemy. I think that's only in the New Testament. Is it there in the Old Testament as well? Yes, it is there in the Old Testament. I remember when Gideon was about to go with men to fight, uh, and God said, I cannot fight with you when you are this number, and he told him to test them by taking them to, to the stream of water, and those who will drink water while putting their armory down will get uh, will not be picked, and he told those ones who were able to just lick the water, something like that. Uh, I think it has also been there in the Old Testament. Even we can see Samson, we can see Elisha when they were attacked by Assyrians. Mm -hmm. There are so many good examples. Yes, thank you, Lubega. Yeah, about Elisha, you know, uh, when uh, the army came and surrounded them, Elisha's servant said, you know, there's a huge army in the morning. You know, he wakes up, he sees this huge army, and then Elisha see, is able to see in the, uh, the uh, angelic army uh, that has come to defend them. He says, uh, those who are with us are greater than uh, those who are uh, the, the army that has come to fight against us, and uh, the servant is not able to understand. And then Elisha prays and says, God, open his eyes to so be able to see the angelic army. So he opens his eyes and he sees uh, chariots of fire. Uh, so yes, we see that. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Right in the Garden of Eden, when uh, God created Adam and Eve, He said, uh, "You know, uh, uh, you know, fill the uh, uh, fill the earth, uh, be blessed, be fi fill the be fruitful, uh, fill the earth, and uh, subdue, uh, you know, subdue the earth." So remember, I I I, uh, um, I kind of uh, explain what is uh, subdue. The word subdue, we said it's a military term. Uh, why did God have to tell Adam and Eve uh, to subdue when everything uh, uh, was perfect and good that he created? Because after he created each thing on each day, all six days, he said, it is good, it's perfect. Uh, so why subdue? Uh, so basically we saw, I explained and I said, you know, there is uh, an enemy, uh, uh, Satan, and uh, God knows he's all out to make what he has done perfect as imperfect. Um, and so um, God created Adam and Eve and gave them, uh, you know, created them in his image and likeness. They have the authority of God. He's given them the authority to fill the earth, to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue it. He's given them uh, the authority. And uh, we see that, um, you know, instead of using their authority, they gave over their authority uh, to Satan. They were not able to subdue him but he was able to subdue them. Um, and we also see, we read, I think, in Psalms chapter 115 or Psalms chapter 113, where it says, uh, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. So he had given authority for us over the earth. Um, uh, uh, he had given man the authority over the earth, but we see that man gave over the authority to Satan. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he... Um, uh, took back everything that Satan had taken away uh, from us. And then we are now given the keys of the kingdom. We are not just given the keys of the kingdom, but we've also been given everything that we need uh, to fight our spiritual um, battle. So in the New Testament, we see um, both the church and uh, the individual believers are often addressed in military terms. Uh, it conveys to us that the church uh, in a spiritual sense, is an army. Uh, 
uh, is a militant force that is engaged in spiritual warfare. Uh, why are we engaged in spiritual warfare? Because we have a real enemy, um, uh, and that is Satan. Um, he is a spirit being, uh, and his uh, demonic uh, forces are also spirit beings, and so we are engaged uh, in a spiritual uh, battle, in a spiritual warfare. Um, the passage in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 to 19, which we read, uh, I think on Monday when we were, yeah, on Monday when we were doing about uh, uh, the church, the foundation of truth uh, of the Son of God, uh, we looked at uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 and 19, um, where Jesus asked Peter, uh, who do you say, uh, to ask the disciples, who do you say I am? And uh, Peter, without a second thought, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus tells him that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then he says, Peter, uh, uh, you know, on this rock, you are Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of uh, hell will not prevail against it. And in verse 19, we looked at the verse 19 specifically, he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And I said, keys symbolize what? What does keys symbolize? Anyone remembers what I said on Monday? Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. So what does keys symbolize? Come on, it was a class on Monday. I'm sure, sure you should remember. What does keys symbolize? The word begins with, the answer begins with an A. Thank you, Anita. Keys symbolize authority. So we've been given the power. We've been given the authority. Thank you, Lubega. Uh, and says, whatever you bind, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That means, well, you know, we have been given the authority to usher in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So what, and I said that whatever we see on earth here is not of heaven that we bind. Uh, and whatever we know is in heaven that we release here on earth. And I told you all the things, um, you know, that we can bind and all the things that we can release. Uh, and so we see that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus uh, in Matthew um, uh, chapter uh, 16 tells us that uh, uh, Jesus describes a church as a body that is authorized by heaven to bind and loose and to go against the powers of uh, darkness. We also see Apostle Paul using a lot of the military uh, imagery in his epistles, uh, you know, depicting believers uh, as engaged in a spiritual conflict. Uh, he also gives us the full description of uh, uh, the armor of God or the spiritual armor that we need to clothe ourselves in so that we can uh, fight against every spiritual forces or wickedness in the heavenly realms. And uh, we see the spiritual armor or this heavenly armor uh, that Paul uh, mentions in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, and we are also taught and trained how to uh, use these weapons and how to engage in uh, spiritual um, warfare, okay? So at the personal level, uh, all of us as believers, uh, we need to resist the devil uh, and his schemes uh, to overcome temptations and give the devil no room or access into our lives. So if you just open the door a little bit, you know, it's just a foothold uh, space we can give him. He can enter in. Uh, that's more than enough for him to cause confusion and uh, destroy our lives because we know that uh, Satan is described as a thief. He's a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we know that, you know, thieves don't need the main door to be open ajar, but they just need a small opening somewhere in the house. They're able to break through and uh, steal, kill, and even destroy the house. So, you know, we don't even give Satan a foothold. It can be just one wrong thought, one a uh, uh, wrong uh, scene or a picture, an image that we see, uh, you know, uh, 
as we're surfing the internet or it can just be one lie. Uh, it can just be, you know, something that we do that just gives him a foothold to enter in uh, and to destroy our lives. So we need to, at a person level, know how to resist the devil uh, uh, and his schemes to overcome uh, temptations and uh, give the devil no access into our um, lives. And so we have everything God has given us. You know, the, this, there's a verse in scripture that says God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. God has not left us with, uh, you know, just fighting our own battles. He's given us every weapon uh, that we need. Uh, uh, he's given us a shield of faith, uh, uh, the sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God. He's given us the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, so we have everything that we need to know how to use it, to hold it in place um, and uh, hold up our shield of faith so that we can quench every uh, dart of the evil one that he throws against us. So what are some of the spiritual weapons uh, that we have as believers that God has given us? What are some of the spiritual weapons uh, that uh, God has given us as believers to fight our spiritual battles, to fight against our enemy? Come on, what are the spiritual weapons God has given us? Yes, thank you. He's given us prayer. Thank you, Siddhikenu. Uh, the word of God, yes, thank you, Rubega and Anita. Thank you, Nicholson, yes, the word. What else? Prayer, word. Anything else? Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, faith, okay. The power to bind, okay, righteousness, yes, thank you. Okay, please note these things because these are important. Uh, the name of Jesus, remember when uh, uh, Jesus sent out uh, uh, the 12 and then he sent out the 70, uh, you know, they came back very excited. They said, uh, you know, Jesus, in your name, you know, the demons shudder and shiver and they flee. They were so excited uh, to see all of this. And, uh, you know, he had given them the authority of his name, the name of Jesus. And we've also been given uh, the authority as uh, uh, believers, uh, you know, to use the name of Jesus. And we know the name of Jesus, there's healing, there's wholeness, there's deliverance. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the demon shuddered and shivers. Satan uh, flees at the very name of Jesus. So name of Jesus. Then all of you said the word of God. Uh, the third thing is the blood of Jesus, that uh, which is the completed work of Christ. Okay, so through which, you know, we, we are made righteous, we are justified, we are redeemed. So it's the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed, the blood of the Lamb, which was the full sufficient, perfect sacrifice that made the perfect uh, atonement uh, or the propitiation for our sins. You know, that is our, um, our uh, powerful weapon that we can cover ourselves with, that we can cover our... Uh, our uh, ministries, we can cover our families, so the name of Jesus, the word of God, the blood of Jesus and the completed work of the cross, uh, you know, so so the gift of salvation, uh, we declare uh, when we want to receive healing, when we want to receive deliverance, when we want to see breakthroughs uh, in our life, uh, we um, declare uh, the the finished work of the cross uh, through the blood of uh, Jesus Christ. And that is why partaking in the Lord's uh, table is a powerful reminder and we can appropriate, we can receive all of the blessings that um, uh, Jesus has uh, purchased for us on the cross. Um, 
The next thing is our position in Christ. You know, uh, we are uh, now seated in heavenly realms. Uh, that is our position. We are uh, made righteous uh, uh, in God's sight. We are justified. We are seen just as if we have never sinned. Uh, God loves us the same way he loves his son. We are on the same level as Jesus Christ. So we need to know our position. We need to know our identity. We need to know who we are uh, in Christ. Uh, of course, we also have the full armor of God, which is given to us in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, prayer and intercession, uh, praise and worship, which I said is really powerful. You know, when you are down, uh, depressed, there's brokenness, there's grief. Uh, you know, grief is one way we give and give room to the evil one to work in our lives, um, to cause even more destruction in our lives. So grief very subtly comes in. Uh, you know, there's depression. Uh, so at those times when we really don't feel like praising and worshiping God, it's important for us to do it because it breaks the uh, forces of darkness uh, that are covering us. It just opens up uh, for um, God's reign, his, uh, his presence, his blessings, his uh, activity to just flow through in our lives. So it's praise and worship. And also it is uh, repentance and like Anita said, uh, righteousness and, uh, you know, uh, others said as well. So we have all of these weapons, which are very, very powerful. The important thing, first thing is for us to know. Second thing is for us to use it. Okay. Just speak the name of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very powerful. I, I, uh, I, you know, remember uh, uh, an incident when I was just kind of beginning ministry, just when I was in Bible college, we have uh, seven months of internship. So I chose to go to uh, Kolkata, which is uh, 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 a, uh, a city in, um, in the north of India and um, was working with drug addicts and alcoholics and also with commercial sex workers, children. And uh, there was a girl who was a mainliner heroin addict and uh, uh, the the family wanted help, so she came from uh, uh, you know another part of India, and we couldn't keep her in the residential rehab because it was all men, and it's quite uh, uh, dangerous in a sense. They can you know uh, have emotional attachment to each other, and there are no other uh, girls there. So uh, you know the. The, the leader wanted her to be with me in the apartment. And, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, big responsibility to take care of uh, somebody because they can run away. They can easily get drugs from somebody. They can die of an overdose and you will be held responsible. I remember that when she came in and that was, uh, you know, I've come from a very traditional church where we were not taught about the uh, Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, even in Bible college, we were not taught about all of these things. Uh, and so all of you are really privileged because when I look at uh, all the subjects that you are learning, um, I wish I would have learned it when I was in Bible college. Um, uh, you know, uh, so you are really privileged to receive all of this. We learned it later on after coming out of Bible college. Even as we are teaching you all, we are still learning. Uh, I'm still learning. Sorry, not me. I'm still learning. Um, so, you know, um, so I didn't know that, you know, there's the forces of darkness that can work against us because we were never taught all of this at church or in Sunday school. Uh, so I just had this girl and it was my first day and I was very exhausted. I was, I remember just lying down in the apartment and she was lying down next to me, uh, you know, in, uh, in a separate cot. And uh, I was conscious that I should not fall off asleep because she could quietly escape. Uh, um, and I suddenly, you know, had somebody choking, uh, uh, you know, just pressing me down on my neck like this, holding my neck down. And I was trying to look at this girl to get help, but there was a force that was hitting my face uh, towards the wall. And I could just see my, my legs, you know, uh, doing this. I, I, I thought I'm going to die because I just couldn't breathe. Uh, and I didn't know what to do. I was trying again to look at her to get help, but there was this force that was hitting my face towards the wall and I could just couldn't breathe. I could see my hands and legs shaking as if to say there's no oxygen in my body and I'm going to die. And all I said was, uh, uh, Sat uh, I, all I said was, you know, uh, Satan, just leave me. Uh, I didn't even use the name of Jesus. Uh, I just said, Satan, just leave me. And there was immediate 
uh, release, uh, you know, immediate freedom. And I just w- sat up with a big shock and I realized, you know, what authority God has given us as believers, uh, uh, the position that we have, uh, who we are in Christ, that, uh, you know, we don't even, I don't even use the name of Jesus. I just have to say, Satan, just leave me and Oh, there was a uh, uh, release. Uh, so, you know, most of the time we continue to live our lives uh, under the uh, forces or under the uh, the weight of what uh, Satan puts on our lives. But we have, uh, God has given us the authority. He has given us every spiritual weapon uh, that uh, we need. Uh, so we need to use it. Uh, and of course, the spiritual authority does not come uh, just because we accept Christ, the spiritual authority comes because, uh, you know, when we are uh, reading God's word, prayer intercession, uh, worshiping God, uh, living in obedience to God, then uh, the power of the spiritual authority just flows in and through our lives. So even as uh, this morning we have known what are our spiritual weapons, uh, let's use it, uh, use it uh, in humility, uh, in the fear of the Lord, uh, giving thanks to God for what he has done on the cross so that we can receive this authority and this power and use it to build God's kingdom uh, and not just, uh, you know, kind of make fun of it or uh, use it as a magical things that, uh, you know, that we can use sometimes. Okay, so we'll stop class here. Uh, any questions anyone has? No questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we'll end class and I'll see you all on um, on um, Friday. Uh, this evening, I'll be posting your uh, uh, second assessment on uh, doctoral foundations, okay? Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good day and I'll see you on Friday.